Secretary can fund whatever program she chooses to the tune of up to $2 billion a year. That kind of money can purchase a lot of elective abortions, which strikes at the conscience of so many taxpayer-paying Americans. Again, I urge my colleague to vote in favor of this rule and the underlying bill, and with that, I reserve the balance of my time. Joe Owen reserves the balance of time. The gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, that's just about the most convoluted, backward argument that I uh, can imagine that I've heard in the 19 years that I'm now here in the United States Congress. There is not one dime in the Prevention and Public Health Fund that can or will be used for an abortion. The law in this land, enunciated by a legend and an icon, among other things, Henry Hyde was, is that federal funds cannot be used for that purpose. And to carry us into that Netherland uh, that the previous speaker just spoke of is astoundingly wrong. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes uh, to the distinguished gentlewoman from Texas, my good friend, Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. I ask her. Revise and extend. I, I thank the distinguished gentleman from, from uh, Florida and uh, carefully and uh, enthusiastically associate myself with uh, his uh, response. We're all colleagues here and we call each other distinguished colleagues. And I call my good friend from Virginia a distinguished colleague, of which I disagree with with wide and well versed opposition. First of all, as we approach both a sacred holiday for many of us in this country, it is one of sacrifice, and as we move into the month of May, begin to look at how mothers uh, sacrifice to take care of their children uh, and not themselves. Many of us during this time frame will be fasting because we find that this draconian road that our Republican friends are on with the minutest and the smallest of majority uh, that voted in this low voting election in 2010 is frightening. And we need prayer. We need to fast. Because this is truly uh, the road to ruin. And I just hope that my colleagues who communicate to the American people will tell the truth. Uh, the budget, the repeal of the prevention and public health, the CR, all of them are the road to ruin. And whether you agree with our president or not, he has it right. The country we can believe in. And when you have the Washington Post or any newspaper, newspaper saying on the CR that more than half of the, of the $38 billion in cuts uh, that are used in this CR for tomorrow are taken out of education, labor, and health programs. While those at the top 2% or 1% of the tax brackets keep going on and on, many of whom said that we're willing to sacrifice, we're willing to offer to be able to help this country. And then they want to repeal uh, the prevention and public health bill so that the brunt of people going to medical care will be in the emergency room because they will not have had cholesterol check or high blood pressure check or sickle cell or diabetes. They won't have any of that. They'll go into the emergency room, lay it out in a coma. That's what the repeal of this legislation is all about. The question you ask the Republicans is what is the dream or the vision of America for them? It is a road to ruin. And the budget is an absurd ridiculousness that wants to cut Medicare, wants to cut Medicaid. How can you tell, going back to the CR, the District of Columbia, citizens who pay taxes, that they cannot take their own money and use it for the dictates of their elected body? How can you tell them that? Gentlelady, it is I, I yield the gentlelady an additional 30 seconds. No, no, 30, gentlelady is recognized for 30 seconds. Gentlemen, is enormously kind. I sat and listened to Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who has lost the vote on this floor that she had. And the citizens of that community, the mayor and the city council, could do nothing but take to the streets to protest. How can you dictate what we do with our own dollars? And so over the next 48 hours, you will see the reason why many Americans are fasting, because they see that this country is going down the road of no return. And it hurts my heart to think that we're going to rescind $16 billion that can be used to make a healthier country, to make a country where children can have access to health care. Well, 
Little 10-year-old doesn't die the because lady, he has an abscess. I ask my colleagues the to vote down all expired. these rules the and stop us from going to the road the to ruin. The time has expired. The from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I feel I have to respond somewhat to my colleague from Florida on some of the points that he made. He um, said that it is the law of the land that no federal government money can be used to fund abortions. I know my colleague from Florida has been here a lot longer than I have been, and I know that he understands the difference between discretionary spending and mandatory spending. And I know that he knows that the Hyde Amendment uh, is only on appropriations bills. And as I explained earlier, Mr. Speaker, the appropriations bills are what we call discretionary spending. And then what the Democrats did in the health care bill was to put this $2 billion in that bill and call it mandatory spending, which is not subject to the annual appropriations process and therefore does not have the restriction of the Hyde Amendment to apply to it. So I would like to ask my colleague from Florida if he can guarantee on his own word to the American people today that nothing from this $2 billion that is, a pro is put in for mandatory spending, it's on automatic pilot, would ever be spent for abortions. Could the, would the gentleman yield and would he, would he answer that question? Of course I will and I thank the general lady for yielding. Um, uh, don't, please let's have a clear understanding that no dollars from this fund are going to be used uh, uh, for abortion. Can now, the gentleman have, guarantee that? I don't have any uh, opportunity to guarantee whether or not I'm going to be alive the next 30 seconds, let alone tell you uh, what may happen. But if you ask my belief, and yours was your belief, that it may be used is what you said, my dear friend. And all I'm saying is it is not going to be. And the law enunciated through Henry Hyde and almost verbatim has been included in the Affordable Health Care Act precludes the use of money for abortions. That I think I would like to reclaim my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman has just made my point. He cannot guarantee that this money will not be used for abortions, and neither can anyone else. And that is the point that we are making, Mr. Speaker. There is no accountability for this $2 billion. It is a slush fund for the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and it is wrong, Mr. Speaker, for us to take the hard-earned money of American taxpayers, give it to the Secretary with no accountability and with the distinct possibility that the money could be used to fund abortions. The Liberals ruling Washington the past four years have failed to address out-of-control, mandatory, or discretionary spending. In fact, under their control, discretionary spending has increased 84 percent in just two years. As I mentioned earlier, discretionary spending is the money Congress decides annually to spend on programs with inherent congressional oversight. Mandatory or autopilot spending is the money that is automatically pulled from the Treasury without regular congressional oversight. I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, when that decision was made for Congress to abrogate its responsibility, but it's a weasel way out. We should be looking at every dollar every year because that's our responsibility. Our debt and the Liberals' insatiable appetite for perpetual government spending increases are sending America into a tailspin. In response to the complete lack of leadership and fiscal responsibility, 
House Republicans have been very aggressive in reducing wasteful government overspending, which is the real source of breathtaking budget deficits and private sector unemployment. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to point out a chart that um, comes, I believe, from the Joint Committee uh, and, uh, on, e on economics, and it shows what happens when you increase government spending and when you decrease government spending when you're talking about private sector job creation. Every dollar the government takes from the private sector is one less dollar to be spent for private sector innovation and job growth. The government can create only government jobs. In addition, Mr. Speaker, to the 13.5 million Americans counted in the official unemployment rate, more than 900,000 Americans have stopped looking for a job because they think no jobs exist for them. I want to point out here that, again, when we saw increased government spending, you see a decrease in private sector jobs. When you see decreased government spending, you see an increase in private sector jobs. That's what the Republicans want to do. Americans want jobs. They want to work. We need to cut government spending and allow the private sector to grow. More than 45 percent of Americans seeking work have been unemployed for more than 27 weeks. Real problems demand real solutions, Mr. Speaker. The track record in the House in three short months demonstrates that the new House Republican majority has heard the American people and is acting to provide the relief and solutions they deserve. Less government spending is crucial to encouraging private sector job creation and reducing unemployment, and where better to cut possible government spending than where money could be used uh, for abortions. With that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves your time. The gentleman from Florida. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield three minutes to my good friend from California, Ms. Matsui, a former member of the Rules Committee that we miss. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. S thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the gentleman from Florida for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I'm in strong opposition to the rule and the bill before us today. In 2008, I introduced legislation to create a Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund. Much of what I see in the Prevention and Public Health Fund resemble the goals in my legislation. I introduced the legislation and fought for these preventive care provisions during the Energy and Commerce Committee debate on the health care law. I believe investing in preventive health care is vital to helping Americans access the care they need to stay healthy, reduce their health care costs, and ease the burden on our overcrowded emergency rooms. Mr. Speaker, we spend more than $2 trillion annually on health care, more than any other nation on earth. Yet, tens of millions of Americans still suffer from preventable and chronic diseases. In fact, approximately 75% of the nation's health care expenditure is spent on treating chronic conditions. These conditions account for 7 of 10 deaths in America. For too long, the health delivery system in our country has been focused on only treating people after they get sick, not before. Prevention has been a luxury, if not an afterthought. Studies have shown that regular access to primary and preventive care can help keep people healthier, help avoid chronic conditions, catch diseases earlier, and therefore help lower costs. Sacramento resident Tyler, an active teenager, was a picture of model health. One day, he noticed that he was having heart problems during football practice. Taking precautions, his parents took him to a doctor to run tests and found that he had a cardiac abnormality. Today, after taking the necessary preventive steps, Tyler is healthy. Thankfully, he sought preventive measures early which kept his condition from worsening and likely saved his life. Not every story ends as happily as Tyler's, though. Millions of Americans every year are diagnosed with chronic diseases because they did not have such access to preventive care. That is the focus of this fund, to improve prevention. This funding will reduce individual and taxpayer costs while saving lives. 
However, that fact is being overlooked by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. This bill before us will have a devastating effect on the future health of America, both in terms of our physical health and for our fiscal responsibility. In order to truly improve both our health and our health care in this country, we must focus on prevention. I urge my colleagues to oppose this rule and the underlying bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back the balance of time. Who seeks rec Gentlewoman from uh, North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to point out again that Republicans would like to see more preventive care. However, the example that my colleague from California used says nothing about this bill because there's nothing in here to guarantee that this money will go to preventive care. Absolutely nothing. There's no accountability in this legislation. With that, Mr. Speaker, I'll reserve the balance. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Florida. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to my good friend, the gentleman from Texas, my classmate, Gene Green. Gentleman, uh, gentleman from Texas, recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to both this rule and H.R. 217, the legislation to repeal the <coughs> Prevention and Public Health Fund of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act uses hide like language. I was on the Energy and Commerce Committee, I still am. We put it in the, the Affordable Health Care Law that there will not be one penny of federal funds that will go for elective abortions. The Hyde Act may be on appropriations bill, but the Affordable Care Act has that language in there. I know there's going to be a lot of talk during debate about the legislation and how we need to reduce our deficit and tough funding cuts we need to be made by Congress in order to bring down our national debt. H.R. 217 is not meaningful legislation to reduce our debt, nor is it a plan to create jobs or spur the growth in our economy. This legislation is yet another attempt by the majority to dismantle and repeal the Affordable Care Act because they do not have the support to do the straight appeal of health reform. As a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I know this bill would be the first of several pieces that will mark a reversal of position by the majority on what's previously been bipartisan supported health care concepts. I've worked across the aisle for years with my colleagues on many prevention provisions, including one including prevention and public health fund that would fund the integration of primary care services into publicly funded mental and behavioral health set settings. To date, Texas alone has received $495,000 for this program. I introduced this legislation several years with bipartisan support from Representative Tim Murphy. At the time, it was called the Community Mental Health Services Improvement Act. And yet here we are today rolling back funding on these important bipartisan provisions to fulfill campaign promises. We know that prevention programs will ultimately save our health care system in the future. We, we did with the Prevention and Public Health Fund and the Affordable Care Act was to make a down payment on reducing preventable health conditions such as diabetes, obesity, strokes, and heart disease. The fund represents an unprecedented investment, $15 billion over 10 years, that will help prevent disease, detect it early, and manage conditions before they become severe. By con concentrating on the causes of chronic disease, the Affordable Care Act helps move the nation from a focus on sickness Fired. and disease to based on wellness and prevention. Fired. I yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. The gentleman is uh, recognized for additional 30 seconds. Don't let the majority fool you today by saying this legislation is a cost-saving measure. Several things that won't be highlighting in relation to this legislation are that cost, treating, uh, cost of treating these chronic diseases alone in Texas totaled over $17.2 billion in chronic diseases resulting to $75.3 billion in lost productivity and economic costs in my home state of Texas. If we want to have a debate on saving money and creating jobs, and I'd like the majority to show us their job creating and deficit reduction plan. They've been in power now for 100 days, and we've spent most of the time creating more debt by repealing provisions in the health reform law. It would actually save my state and constituents billions of dollars. Today's yet another Gentleman's example of the expired. majority's misguided priorities. And, Mr. Speaker, I yield back my Gentleman's time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll continue to reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Would you uh, please inform both sides the remaining amount of time? The gentleman from Florida has seven minutes remaining. The gentleman from North Carolina has six minutes remaining. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if we defeat the previous question, I'm going to offer an amendment to the rule to provide uh, that immediately after the House adopts this rule, it will bring up H.R. 1354, the American Jobs Matter Act of 2011, 
uh, 11. And I am pleased to yield five minutes to uh, address that to the gentleman from uh, Connecticut, my friend, Mr. Murphy. The gentleman from Connecticut is uh, recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman from Florida. You know, in Washington over the last few months, we've seen a lot of what we're seeing today. A lot of talk from my Republican colleagues about ideological budget cuts, uh, about divisive social issues, and today, once more, we are here debating repeal of part or all of the health care bill. But back home, we're hearing about one thing and largely one thing only, and that's job creation. Now, I appreciate my friend from North Carolina dressing up her remarks with some talk about jobs, but this debate today isn't about creating jobs. This debate is about a political agenda to take on the democratically passed health care bill. But we need to start plugging into where Main Street is and having a real conversation about job creation in this country. And so I'm here today to talk about one idea in particular that can reach out to the 5,000 manufacturers in my state and the tens of thousands more of manufacturing employees who are looking for good middle class work and help from Congress that hasn't been forthcoming in the last three months. Since 2001, this country has shut down over 42,000 manufacturing plants. We've lost about 5 million manufacturing jobs. But during that same period of time, we've increased spending on defense manufacturing in this country by 81 percent. The problem is that 81 percent increase hasn't gone to factories in Connecticut or Florida or North Carolina or anywhere else. It's gone overseas because after decades of building loophole after loophole into our domestic sourcing laws like the Buy America Act, we are hemorrhaging manufacturing jobs in part because we're spending more and more taxpayer dollars overseas. So we need to defeat this previous question so that we can bring a common sense jobs bill to the floor of the House of Representatives, the American Jobs Matter Act. Now, let me explain what this bill does. It's pretty simple. It says that any time a federal agency is awarding a contract, in particular the Defense Department, that they can give a leg up, that they can give preference to the bidder who promises and guarantees to create more U.S. jobs. Now, most of my constituents think that that already happens. They already think that we have some system in place to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are being used to give preference to American companies rather than foreign companies. It's not happening. The law doesn't allow it. So let's pass today the American Jobs Matter Act. It'll make sure that our money gets spent on our jobs here at home. Let me tell you a quick story from Connecticut. I've got a company that makes copper nickel tubing in Waterbury, Connecticut. They're the only American company that supplies that product to the Virginia submarine class, and there's one company in Europe that makes it. But because we can't give them preference by law today, they've lost one of their two most important contracts to that European supplier, and along with it, dozens of American jobs. That's our money going overseas. And we need to do something about it rather than debating the health care bill all over again when people really care about building back those manufacturing jobs. We should, in fact, be spending every day in this Congress talking about bills like the American Jobs Matter Act. Instead, we're talking about defunding Sesame Street, about destroying Planned Parenthood, and once again today talking about repealing the health care bill, and in fact, a part of the health care bill that's going to create jobs through preventative health care services. It's no wonder Americans think so little of this Republican Congress, because they're not focused on what people out there are focused on, J-O-B-S, jobs. The American Jobs Matter Act, if we bring it before the floor today, is a common sense measure to simply target taxpayer money to the creation of American jobs. We don't have to spend any more money to create American jobs. We just have to spend the money we're already spending better. We spend half the military dollars in the world coming out of the U.S. budget. And this engine of expenditure should be used not only to make this country stronger militarily, but also to make it stronger economically. The American Jobs Matter Act is one way to get there, and I urge my colleagues to defeat the previous question so we can get to the real business of this country, creating good paying middle class jobs. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The uh, gentlewoman from North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're prepared to close, and I'll reserve the balance of my time. I'd say to the gentlelady that I'll be the last speaker so that she can uh, be prepared. The the Lord is recognized for the I do ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment that Mr. Murphy spoke to in the record, along with extraneous material, immediately prior to the vote on the previous Without question. Without objection. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, no um, um, uh, uh, prevention and public health funds are or can be used to pay for abortions, and this bill has absolutely nothing uh, to do with that. What it will stop, this bill as offered by the ruling uh, Republican House, is immunization for kids and seniors, or programs to stop childhood obesity and to prevent heart disease and or diabetes. That's um, uh, what they are stopping, so please don't be misled. No dollars from this fund will be used for abortion. If we as legislators are to be about the business of helping Americans live healthy, productive lives, we must change our fundamental approach to health care by investing in illness prevention, not just treatment. The Prevention and Public Health Fund is the key to a coordinated, comprehensive, sustainable, and accountable approach to improving our nation's health outcomes. I'd also add that at a time when Americans are looking to Congress for leadership, the Republican ruling majority in the House are continuing their assault on comprehensive health care reform that expands coverage to 32 million people instead of focusing on job creation. It's time to stop playing games with the health of the American people and get down to business. I urge my colleagues to vote no and defeat the previous question so that we can debate and pass a jobs bill without any further delay. I also urge a no vote on the rule, and I yield back the remaining time. The gentleman bills back his remaining time. The gentlewoman from, Florida, uh, from uh, North Carolina, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I I'd just like to say in response to um, my colleague from Florida that I think this bill has a lot more, and um, this rule and the underlying bill have a lot more to do with elective abortions than it does with government contracting. Mr. Speaker, we've discussed at great length today why Secretary Sebelius does not need a slush fund set on autopilot. The American people expect their elected representatives to be wise guardians of their hard-earned dollars. They vehemently objected uh, to the ruling Democrat agenda of federal overreach into their daily lives and sent a clear message to Washington last November. Government must be responsible and accountable. All across America, American families are tightening their belts, cutting their budgets, and living within their means. It's time Washington did the same. For these reasons and many more that I, I urge my colleagues, for these reasons and many more, I urge my colleagues to vote for this rule and the underlying bill so we can restore congressional spending oversight and save the taxpayers $16 billion over the next 10 years. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker, and move the previous question on the resolution. All time having billed, <coughs> yielded back, the question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. No. Uh, opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. No, Speaker, no. on that I request the yeas and the nays. The nays requested. All members uh, requesting a vote by the yeas and nays will stand. Sufficient number having risen. The yeas and nays are ordered. Members were ordered to record, the, <coughs> to record their votes by electronic, electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 20, rule to, uh, the 15-minute vote on the ordering of the previous question will be followed by five-minute votes on the adoption of House Resolution 219, if ordered. Uh, ordering the previous question on the House Resolution 218 and the adoption of the House Resolution 218, if ordered. The House now holding the first series of votes for the day, beginning with a procedural vote on the rule for debating the Prevention and Public Health Fund repeal, providing money to states and local communities for preventative health care programs. It's a 15-minute vote, followed by a vote on the rule itself. That will be followed by a procedural vote on the rule for the federal spending agreement that expires on September 30th. A vote on the rule follows that. Votes on final passage of that legislation comes up tomorrow. 
The Senate also in session today. Senators resuming work on a bill continuing programs for small high-tech and research companies. Members gaveled in this morning at 9.30. It's been uh, general speeches. Right now they're talking about the federal budget. You can see live coverage of the Senate on our companion network, C-SPAN 2.
House members are holding a procedural vote on the rule for debating the Prevention and Public Health Fund repeal. It provides money to states and local communities for preventative health care programs. 15-minute vote underway. We expect a vote on the rule after this. And then procedural voting on the rule for the federal spending agreement that members worked out shortly before temporary federal funding was set to run out last Friday under threat of a government shutdown. There will be a vote on the rule itself after that. And votes on final passage would take place tomorrow. If it does pass here, the rule does pass here. If passed in the House tomorrow, that bill would move on to the Senate for debate. The measure itself would fund the federal government until September 30th of this year. From the Associated Press this afternoon, forcefully rejecting Republican budget-cutting plans, President Obama today proposed lowering the nation's future deficits by $4 trillion over a dozen years with a package that includes reducing spending on politically sensitive health care programs and raising taxes on high-earning Americans. The president gave his speech at George Washington University just a short time ago. We aired it live on C-SPAN 3. And right now, we're taking your phone calls on the president's speech and uh, also including your tweets. Again, you can see that on C-SPAN 3 right now.
Ayes are 238, the nays are 282. Previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. Those in favor say no. The ayes have it. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. General from Massachusetts. I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays have been requested. Those in favor of the yeas and nays will stand. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. The members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The second of four votes now as members vote on the rule for debating the Prevention and Public Health Fund repeal, providing money to states and local communities for preventive health care programs. This is a five-minute vote, as will be the remaining votes during this series. Then procedural voting on the rule for the federal spending agreement that members worked out shortly before temporary federal funding was set to run out last Friday. There will be a vote on the rule itself afterwards. Votes on final passage could take place tomorrow. Now, if it is approved in the House tomorrow, it will move on to the Senate for debate and uh, passage there. The measure would fund the government until September 30th of this year. From CQ this afternoon, President Obama today proposed what he called a balanced fiscal overhaul that would shave $4 trillion from deficits over a dozen years through a combination of spending cuts and increased revenues generated by a tax code overhaul. The plan recommends reductions in the cost of entitlement programs, but offers nothing like the restructuring of Medicare and Medicaid proposed by House Republicans based on information provided by the White House prior to the speech on taxes. The president reiterated his call to allow George W. Bush era tax cuts for couples who earn more than $250,000 on our website, cspan.org.
Both the ayes are 237, the nays are 180. The motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion reconsiders laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on ordering the previous question of House Resolution 218, on which the yeas and nays were ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Calendar Number 29, House Resolution 218, resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1473, making appropriations for the Department of Defense and the other departments and agencies of the government for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2011, and for other purposes, providing for consideration of the concurrent resolution, House Concurrent Resolution 35, directing the Clerk of the House of Representatives to make a correction on the enrollment of H.R. 1473 and providing for consideration of the concurrent resolution, House Concurrent Resolution 36, directing the Clerk of the House of Representatives to make a correction in the enrollment of H.R. 1473. The question is on ordering the previous question. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. So this is the third of four votes now as the House moves on to a, a procedural vote on the rule for the federal spending agreement that members worked out last Friday. Assuming this is agreed to, there will be a vote on the rule itself after this. Votes on final passage could take place tomorrow. From the Associated Press this afternoon, it's supposed to produce $38 billion in savings, but a new budget estimate shows that the spending bill negotiated between President Obama and House Speaker John Boehner would produce less than 1% of those savings by the end of this budget year. The Congressional Budget Office estimate shows that the spending bill would trim just $352 million from the deficit through September 30th. It's coming up for a House vote tomorrow.
On this vote, the yeas are 242, the nays are 182, 183. The motion is adopted. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Please, the chair, the ayes have it. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays have been requested. Those in favor of the uh, voting by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having yet risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members are, will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five minute vote. Votes now on final passage of the rule for the federal spending agreement that members worked out last Friday. It calls for an hour of general debate, equally divided, no amendments. Votes on final passage could take place tomorrow. From the Hill newspaper today, three Republican senators are proposing a Social Security reform package that would raise the retirement age to 70 and cut benefits for the wealthy. Senators Lindsey Graham, Rand Paul, and Mike Lee say that it will put the entitlement program on a long-term path to solvency without increasing taxes. The senator said that their plan would gradually raise the retirement age from 67 to 70 and would not affect individuals aged 56 or older. That again from the Hill newspaper today by Jordan Fabian.
Vote, the yeas are 241, the nays are 179. The resolution is adopted without objection. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put to de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The journal stands approved. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks.